Good morning. Well, it's good morning here in the Netherlands, and I'm pretty sure it's in a different time zone when you to Singapore and to, to Perth, Australia, and, and other different places around the world. Well, people will be watching uh, this IFLA webinar of Back and Thinking Forward. And we're in a session of Future of Libraries in a post COVID world. I am really excited uh, to be here. We have 19 minutes. 90 minutes in which we will talk about everything that, that's happening around us, uh, the way um, libraries are doing uh, locally in the different places of the people that are in this session and how they're dealing with the, the COVID virus and how they're already thinking of what may come after this crisis and how libraries will come out of this and, and develop further. So, um, I would say let, let's waste no time and, and, and I will ask the participants in this session, starting with, with Liz Jolly, uh, to, to please Liz, can you introduce yourself shortly and, and say uh, where you're from, what you're doing and uh, how happy you are to be in this <laughs> right. Thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Eric. Of course, I'm delighted uh, to, to be here. Um, I've been chief librarian at the British Library in the UK uh, since September uh, 2018. Uh, I'm rep responsible for teams delivering our core activities such as collection development, services for researchers, learners, businesses and entrepreneurs, research strategy, digital scholarship, and our cultural program of events, exhibitions, as well as our, our online presence. Previous to that, I worked in the UK higher education uh, sector for 30 years, um, most recently at Teesside University in the northeast of England. Um, I've, um, I'm a trustee of SILIP, a new trustee of SILIP in, in the UK. I've been chair of SCONAL, which is the UK University Library Directors Group. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Liz. And I must say, like, like the Teesside University still uh, comes on my radar every time. They're doing some amazing work with holding, uh, they're organizing student sessions to study in teams. On, they're, doing, they're doing quite they're an example. Do some fantastic stuff, yes. Thank you so much. Before I go to the next person on this great panel, I want to say that um, we're going to reserve time for questions, if I haven't already said so. Please put your questions in the chat. And um, the amazing Liz White is in the back gathering all your questions and we will have some time to, to, to bring the questions to the table and have the panel have a look at it and, and ask them uh, to the best of their abilities. Um, Jean Tan from Singapore, good friend. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, you've been, you, you deserted us for a little while. I'm so happy to have you back in the library field. And, uh, but please so introduce yourself. Thank you, Eric. Uh, hi, everybody. Very nice to see you. It's um, late afternoon in Singapore, and I'm very, very happy to be here, Eric. Uh, yes, I left the library world for about uh, five to six years. Yeah, because I wanted to see what librarians can do outside the library world. Uh, so I was uh, working for the Prime Minister's office for about five to six years, and I worked on a few national projects, one of which was uh, documenting uh, the long history of Singapore, because everyone thinks Singapore is a very young nation. Uh, so I worked on that, and it was a national project that uh, broke the record for um, exhibitions in Singapore. And I was very pleased to show the world in Singapore what librarians can actually do with the knowledge of uh, choreographing content and the ability to just manipulate all of these into an accessible package that is also emotional as well. Uh, before that, I was the director of the National Library and the president of the Library Association of Singapore. I uh, worked on a few um, initiatives like the Singapore Memory Project, which is why Eric knew me, which is collecting um, the memories of people who may not always be famous in Singapore and pulling that together into a story for Singapore. So I'll be happy to talk about that. And at the moment, I am the assistant chief executive of the National Library Board that takes care of the public National Library as well as the National Archives. Well, thank you so much, Jean. And I, like, I, I have been using the Singapore Memories Project in many of my presentations uh, in the past years. It, it's, it's, I was very happy to see recently, and no doubt you saw that too, that in the Library of New South Wales, the State Library, they, they've come up with a similar uh, uh, project of bringing the ideas to life in, uh, in Australia. I, 
I love the little website with the typewriter, it's well done. And uh, so, so I'm sure you are an inspiration to many. Good to have you here. Um, Margaret Ellen, we're talking about Australia. Maybe it's a good idea to go back to you. Everybody knows you, of course, but for the people who may be joining in, uh, can you please introduce yourself once again? Thanks, Eric. And um, it's really great to be here and hello to everyone uh, around the globe. So pleased you can join us. Uh, I'm Margaret Allen. My day job is as CEO and State Librarian at the State Library of Western Australia. Um, we are a legal deposit library for Western Australian publications. That's one part of what we do. So we hold significant uh, material about the history of West Australia. So that's uh, both the colonial settlement, but obviously um, stories of Aboriginal Western Australians and indeed the um, record of exploration of the coast by the Dutch and the English and the French and the Spanish and everyone else that came past. So that's one part of what we do. The other part of our legislated role is to support the network of 233 public libraries in Western Australia. Wow. Western Australia is a huge geographical state. Um, it's, it's absolutely enormous, but actually we only have um, two and a half million people. But we have libraries from uh, Kununurra in the north to Esperance in the south to uh, out to the uh, Australian territories of Christmas Island and the Cocos Islands, and we provide support and work in partnership with local governments to deliver those services. So um, we have one foot in the public library, um, very community focused um, library service camp, and the other one around the collection and preservation of our documentary heritage. On top of that, I'm chair of the IFLA public library section. So I'm really pleased to be here today. We're one of the partners together with our literacy and reading partners delivering over two or three days, some really interesting um, online seminars. So I'm really pleased to be here. I, 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 sorry for the interrupt, but I, when we're talking, I remember you, the Songlines project. And I remember I had an interview once when I still did this week in libraries on that shipwreck. Uh, in the north of uh, Western Australia, where, and there was a whole exhibition traveling from South Africa to Australia back on, on those first people who landed on the shores, who didn't want to land there, but just a shipwreck. And no. they, of course, they stayed there and they, they, they were Dutch and they, had, they started the whole, well, they became Australian. Yeah, yeah the, the, but there's a very rich Dutch heritage and as as it's always been explained to me, the Dutch would come down um, the African coast uh, to, you know, head, head sort of um, around Cape of Good Hope, I think it is, yes, yeah. and go in a long line and then at some stage turn left. Sometimes they left, turning left too late and would end up on the Western Australian coast. Um, <laughs> there's, of course, the Batavia, which was a pretty tragic yeah. story, the wreck of the Batavia. Um, so there's huge Dutch uh, connections here, but as, as are the French and English as well. But unlike the rest of Australia, which focuses on Captain Cook and the yes. English uh, uh, exploration and settlement, ours is much more actually Dutch focused, but yeah, long history. Really long history. And, and well, the, the, I remember it was well done, really well done. Um, mm. Last but definitely not least, uh, Liz McGettigan. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. Um, Liz and I met quite a while ago, I think. Um, and I know Liz for many things, but uh, she was responsible for, for bringing in the Edge Conference, I think, to, to the UK and to Edinburgh uh, at one point. And that's a very, very dear um, gathering. It's, it's not the biggest uh, library conference in the world, but it's one of the most mm -hmm. innovative, I have to say. And, and you're doing amazing work, Liz. But please introduce yourself before I give away everything. <laughs> Hello and welcome from to Scotland. It's so nice to see people from all over the world and thank you for that, um, Eric. And we did indeed found the EDGE conference in Edinburgh and the reason was to take the sort of amazing innovations and technology and people-based activities that we were doing and share them around the globe and bring people like Eric and yourself, many of you, to Scotland to showcase their work. 
Um, I'm currently director of digital library experiences at Solus UK. Um, prior to that, I was head of libraries and information services at the city of Edinburgh. And for many years before that, various other roles in libraries. And I've always been interested and intrigued by technology and innovation, but mostly because of what it can free up the staff to deliver, to do the people facing work that we, I think is most critical more than anything else. I've been a trustee of Scylla. I've been, I'm currently on Philip Scotland board as well. Um, that, that's more or less about, bit about me. We, as Solus, we have 6,000 libraries using our library app across the globe. And we're currently working to develop a digital platform. And, and I always uh, follow what, you, what you're up to on, on the different social media platforms, Liz, and uh, I can't wait to, to, to see that platform and to see the next thing happening. Um, I just realized that I haven't introduced myself. I'm, I'm, I'm totally not wanting to come over like arrogant, everybody knows me, no, that's not the case. I'm, I'm, I'm Eric Bukestein, I'm here. I came this morning, especially to the National Library of the Netherlands to, to, to be here. Uh, that's almost IFLA headquarters. It's just one floor up from, from this room. We are at IFLA headquarters, and that seems appropriate to, to be here. Uh, normally, this place is not open, so I had to sneak my way in uh, to do this from, from the board meeting room. Um, so at the National Library, I do an innovative, I'm on my own sort of innovative team. Libraries in the Netherlands can call me with, if they have a question or they have a new project and they want some help. And I uh, basically, I'm not a project manager, but I help them out, get on their way and uh, connect them to the right people. That's one of the jobs. And furthermore, I'm a bit of an international radar. Uh, in the old days, I did a world trip around libraries around the world. And I met many of you during those trips. Uh, and, um, so there's a lot that comes in on my radio and that's what I'm gonna use today. Uh, Besides that, I have to mention that I'm a board member of my favorite library in the world, and that's Story House in Chester, UK. Uh, it's an amazing place. And if you ever have a chance to come to England, uh, visit the British Library, but also visit Story House in Chester. It's a beauty, it's a gem, and it does a lot of great work. And no doubt it will come to the table. So today, we're gonna to have a conversation on libraries post-COVID. Uh, what's gonna be the future? What's we gonna do? What do we see on our radar? What's happening? Uh, I'm gonna use this book, this book was made by a good friend, Aaron Schmidt, designed in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, he has a blog, Walking Paper. I don't know if he's still very active. Uh, he designed this book and the future for libraries is empty usually, but I put in some notes today, especially for this occasion, because we have to create this future ourselves, people. Um, as I said, the radar. What comes on my radar? Many people send me emails and, and, and I'm very blessed with that. And, and one of the things that comes across uh, that I want to lay out uh, in front of you is um, safety. Some libraries in the world are opening, in Australia they're opening. Uh, and and um, But I find that, that people are still hesitant to, to, to use public spaces again if they don't really have to. So, so my question to each of you is how is that situation locally? Are you open? Are you still closed? And how do you think that we can help people to trust public spaces again, trust our libraries again, and come back to, to use our spaces and to visit us and to lend books? So, so uh, anyone, I can, I can I'm point it out to someone, but, but please pick up. Who would have something to say on this? Liz, can I open it up to you? If, if, if I still see people. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, trust, that's a really, really hard one, isn't it? And, and I, libraries are trusted spaces. We're not yet uh, open. We're opening on uh, Tuesday, <coughs> excuse me, Tuesday the 19th um, of, of April. Um, we have um, 
as, as, as everyone did, pivoted to, to digital. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the um, things we, we have to do when we open our physical spaces is to continue to deliver a hybrid model. And, and I'm sure this will come up later in, in conversation, yes. not to use the positives and the way that we've been able to be more inclusive in, in many ways in service delivery mm -hmm. when we go back to, to opening up our building. We're doing um, so. So our response has been to to um, try and push the message out that we are open, that our library isn't just the physical space, um, uh, even though the building is closed. And as I say, and as all of you will have been doing, delivering our, our services online. Um, and we also um, our, our document delivery service worked closely with our national health service in terms of delivering um, the most recent and up to date research to help in in work around uh, vaccine de uh, vaccine uh, development and, and uh, treatment of, of COVID itself. What I think uh, we have to do um, is, is show um, libraries that we are is continue that out that um, work and I'm not going to say outreach because I'm sure this will come up uh, in, in later conversation we have to continue to work with our communities who, whoever those communities may be we have to continue to develop uh, to show people that we are still relevant and that they can still trust us and that involves ongoing development of relationships and partnerships and that is apart from the very basic safety routines that we have to do you know the the um one-way systems through yes. the building and the, you know at a basic level we're all doing that aren't we that's what you yes. do in the wash hands and the mask wearing and so on but for me this is about um building on on the positives from um from covid and also uh building on change societal changes taking the most of the opportunities that are there of the new relationships, of the new ways we've had to do things. For example, some of our living, we have a network, mm -hmm. and I was interested that Margaret said they have one foot in, in the preservation and, and, and conservation area and one foot in public libraries. While we have no national mandate uh, to lead our public libraries network, we have developed with in partnership with, with public libraries a living knowledge network, and they deliver yeah. some of our cultural events. And prior to COVID, this was very much a membership thing and, and we have we work in partnership with the National Libraries of, of Scotland and Wales too and you know we have members in Aberdeen and it was fascinating seeing people in a small branch library in Aberdeen um, asking questions of Margaret Atwood one evening that was absolutely fantastic to me these during Covid we've opened up those sessions and you know you can argue what are the members getting out but you know that's not not the point the point is that a lot of those sessions and other events have been available to an awful lot more people the British Library has been able to um, expose our exhibitions to, to an awful lot more people. So I think it's about learning from what we can do digitally and building on that and applying that to the physical space. And we are still learning. One of the reasons I'm delighted yeah. to be here is I hope I can learn from what other people are doing too. I hope that's, that's answered your question for, for a start. Well, um, learning always starts by being open for learning. Yeah, yeah. More than open to learning. So, so yeah. no doubt we will learn. Um, before I pass it on, I, I, don't, I, I think I read somewhere how many million people are visiting the British Library, and I don't know if you know it by, by, by heart, but, but did, did, did they send any, did, that you're aware of, did they send many sort of messages like, like in despair, help open up again, please? please yes, please. we've had, a, had an awful lot of, um, we've had an awful lot of really lovely comments saying how much they miss the building and an awful lot of really positive um, comments around um, how we've been missed. I think what we um, have learned to do is to help people online again and think about our inquiry and our support services and our information literacy delivering what we need to do to ensure that people can actually make the most of the building when it does open. And perhaps we haven't uh, thought about that quite as much as we've needed to in the past. Very true. And, and Jean, if you ever go back to Singapore, how is the situation there? And I don't know if you're much aware of what public libraries are doing in the, in the region. But uh, can you just bring us up to speed? What, what is happening out there? Yeah, so in Singapore, we've been gradually opening the library since um, July of last year. So the libraries have been open for a while, uh, but we've been very careful with the facing of the restrictions and the lifting of these. Uh, so in July, we started something called borrow and go, as in you can't stay in the library for long. You can borrow the books and just bring it home. But uh, you can't sit in the library, you can't, you can't 
10 programs. Uh, we have gradually been opening that up. So now you can actually be in the library for a while. And, uh, but there are still restrictions to the numbers of people can be in the library. Yeah, th that's because in Singapore, okay. we have uh, everywhere else, we have safe distancing measures that we have to take care of. Uh, but even so, people are clamoring to come back. I have such belief in libraries. Uh, I mean, come on, guys, even cinemas, uh, King Kong and Godzilla can bring them back. <laughs> yeah. And to me, librarians are the original kaiju. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be able to bring them back uh, by the halls. I'm, I'm very confident about that. And um, so what you've noticed is that people are claiming to come back. So we have queues in the weekends because of the limitations. And uh, volunteers as well. So in the past, we used to have people who come to libraries, volunteers. And they could sign up in groups of 50 or 80. Because okay. people love to work around the library. It's, it's, uh, I don't know whether librarians know this uh, as well as everybody else, but um, what we consider as work, a lot of people find therapeutic. Mm. Yeah, and they, they love doing the work there. So the, the volunteer sign-up sessions have been full like all the time. Wow. And people are clamoring to come back. And we've got to gradually increase that. So people are begging us to open the library so they can come back to serve in the library again. Uh, so there isn't, I would say that I, I, I have a very positive outlook when it comes to the future of libraries. In fact, based on early statistics, um, the fiscal loans or materials from our public libraries mm -hmm. have actually gone slightly ahead of pre-COVID numbers. And this is considering okay. that um, uh, our, our spaces are restricted. There's a limitation to, there are limits to the numbers of income come in. So if, they've just gone up a marginally higher than pre-COVID numbers. And mm -hmm. our digital numbers have been the revelation. They've gone up. So in a very okay. strange kind of way, I, I sort of personally, I see a future that when all our libraries are open, the pie is shockingly going to get bigger for everyone. Yeah. So every time we talk to politicians, Eric, I mean, they would, they would ask me this question like, oh God, you know, is digital going to take over the world? I'm like, guys, have you been <laughs> reading the news for the last 10 years on the death of the book? You obviously have not. Uh, so I don't say that to the minister, of course, because <laughs> I need money. Um, but I think that to myself, and I realized that Actually, the pie is going to get bigger. It's, it's a very strange thing. COVID has, in a very odd sort of way, uh, injected a fresh adrenaline to the growth of libraries. And once it opens, people can see that. Uh, people are even flocking to, as you said, cinemas, what more libraries. So I, I have a lot of confidence. In the region, I think we had a conference recently uh, with the librarians from Indonesia, Philippines, and they are doing their best. Uh, so some of the libraries are still closed, but they are doing their best to go omni-channel. Yeah, so even yeah. like this colleague from Jordan was telling me that in the Jordan public library system, we had people writing in, begging them, you know, and there are some who are saying that, please open, you know, you're my life. I, I can't breathe without you, you know. There, there are all these emotional, maybe Jordanians are very emotional. <laughs> yeah, so, so all these emotional messages and all that. And then in the other libraries, I see the Philippines as well as it, uh, Indonesia, they are still trying their best to go out. Yes. You know, so they have uh, books that are delivered by horses, by motorboats, uh, tricycles, motorbikes. Right, right, right. Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah, So book. they are finding all kinds of ways to still reach out. But I think the key that everyone is doing, including in China, so National Library of China, as well as the Shanghai Library shared with us that uh, they are really leveraging the omni-channel and omnichannel is not just about digital versus physical, but for both of them working together so that together they, uh, they will serve almost like a consistent brand experience. So one will reinforce the other. Like a journey that you start digitally will continue in the physical space. Yeah, so the libraries in the Asia Ocean region, a lot of, a lot of them are exploring this now. Uh, Malaysia has launched a YouTube channel uh, to, and they call it the library channel. But, I think uh, it's like a TV channel. So they push out a lot of content so you can consistently go there uh, to look at materials from the National Library of uh, Malaysia. So I think um, all I can say is I'm very, very hopeful. Yeah, and the day that Black Widow opens, I am, I'm certain that as more libraries open, we'll do as well as the next Marvel movie. Uh, Gene, this, this, <laughs> this session is being recorded. I'm sure you were informed beforehand, no beforehand. Yes. But I think I'm going to play this message uh, like every day before I wake up and get out of bed. I will play your message and, and bring that positivity in, into my room. Um, 
Margaret, you, in Australia, you have been open, and this I get back to you because Jean made a nice bridge to some of the digital uh, uh, acceleration that has happened in COVID and the new adrenaline. But I first want to go to Margaret because in Australian mm -hmm. libraries, I think you were the first to open up again. Uh, yes, we, we've, Australia's been incredibly lucky, I think is the way to describe it. Um, in Western Australia, we were open for, uh, sorry, we were closed for only 56 days um, between March and May. And we've had one period uh, of a quick shutdown earlier this year. Um, and it's been similar, but not quite the same everywhere in Australia. Our colleagues in Victoria have actually had quite a difficult time in comparison to the rest of um, Australia. So. Look, our numbers up until earlier this year were probably down about 30% on visitor numbers, but they're picking up again. And I was thinking that comment about trust. Um, I think you opened, Eric, with that question of trust and how do we get people to trust coming back to libraries. And, and trust is only a thing that happens at a moment in time. We, we talk about libraries as a trusted space to trust us. That's a very um, um, temporary, ephemeral thing if we don't keep working to ensure that we continue to be trusted. So, and, it, and it's in a context of a whole lot of things. And I think the COVID situation has exposed lack of trust in, um, you know, scientific information, lack of trust in governments and openness. And so I think we have to tread really carefully to every day continue that trust. So we have to do that, <clears throat> pardon me, in the physical sense of making sure the libraries are safe. And Jean talked about restrictions. We still have, you know, number restrictions. We have mandatory QR code checking in. We have um, social distancing. We have all of those things. So we have to be seen to be physically a trusted place. On the other hand, we have to continue to make sure that our services are seen as trusted in a digital space, in a walk-in space, um, and really in terms of um, being conscious that our communities have been through an awful experience in the last 12 months, something that none of us could ever think about. You know, it's been 100 years since it happened. So we have to be really attuned to what it is that the communities need. What are they looking for? It might be reading material. It might just be a space to start to feel comfortable with people again and being in a crowd or sharing a computer device because they're worried about whether, you know, the disease is transmittable. So all of those things we're going to have to really concentrate, be really connected to the community to understand what the concerns are and make sure that we frame our services and our response to continue to keep that trust that the community have in us. Margaret, that's the, when we, I was listening to you, I, I, re, I had an, an email from, from, from student, I think a journalist uh, student, uh, who sent me an email about studying and she wanted to do a graduation project on, um, on what we can do uh, to, to bring the digital back to, to the physical. And, and she said like, she was in a supermarket and someone asked for a bonus card to use to get a discount, like these little cards that you, that you have. Uh, and she was like totally blown away by someone she doesn't know came up to her and asked her a question. So this, this, this isolation period has changed people in a bit and they have to come back. And I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm pretty, I'm as positive as Jean that this will happen. Of course it will happen, but that there definitely has, something has happened and sharing like books among the whole group of people and, and having that public thing that, that we own together is something that we have to sort of get back. We have to reclaim that. Yeah. But, but Liz, Liz McGannigan, um, and maybe you, you, your experience thinking in, in digital tools and everything else, what, what is your take on this? How do we, I'm so happy to hear, by the way, I'm happy to hear, Jean, that the physical lending has gone up. That, that's really amazing. We've seen an increase in digital lending but the physical as well, that's, that's really good news. But Liz, back to you, why do you see? Um, I had to agree with a lot 
that Jean had to say there. And I think we have to start by accepting the return might be slower, but the fact is that humans don't really cope well with isolation. So, so I'm, you might not like to say of this, but there's a real opportunity now for the library to reimagine itself. And it's, it's about looking at, are there opportunities to look at external programming? The, one of the things that we have really found is that the library can now offer a space that might be considered safer than pubs and theatres for a while as well. So we would an opportunity to gather a whole new audience. But we have certainly found that people want to go to the library, but they are looking at the contactless access through smartphones and apps. So I see, I can see there is going to be a shift in hardware and libraries and how people use it. We're also seeing an uptake in click and collect, which I think might well be through the app and stay as a service that's provided for a different audience. Um, definitely an opportunity from COVID to, to reimagine the service we provide. I think things like the technology is only going to be about creating a space for people to do things like conversation cafes. I love technology, but yeah. for me, it's only going to be about freeing up the staff to from the transactional elements of what they do to work with the people. And that is going to be more important than ever post pandemic. But Liz, I mean, we, we cannot go because we could go talk on an hour on this, but like I said, we had the, 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 the people being able to, to lend book without giving to the desk and um, self-checkout I was looking for. Um, and that didn't free up staff because like basically it was another reason to sometimes let go of staff. And how do we make sure, and like I said, we can't talk for hours, but we have to be aware that we make sure that uh, it will not be a reason if we go digital to just do it with less staff because I think librarians are so extremely important with the right skills to be in the building and to help people, as you say, but we have to make sure that they are not let go because of the digital. Absolutely, I, th I agree. But I think the whole idea of the way of people have felt so isolated that the beauty of the library is going to be the fact that the, the staff will be able to, to do that nurturing and the conversation cafes and the programming. And I think if the programming and the investment in that sort of stuff is exciting and good enough, there would not be any impact. The last thing I ever want to see is a library without staff. That is the most critical part of a library is the, are the staff. I, I see I see a hand from 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 this Jolly. Can I, I I think I agree with absolutely, you know, Liz and, and with you, Eric. It's really important. There's a re some really good examples from UK higher education pre-COVID whereby technology has, as, as Liz said, freed up people from transactional elements. In my, my last role, we removed, there was no library issue desk, no, no counter at all. And people were there wandering around, obviously post COVID, this is going to need rethinking too. But the whole point was that the role of frontline staff was to help uh, people with their learning and research. And, and, and actually libraries at heart are about learning, aren't they, and knowledge creation, whatever that, that's for, whether that's just learning to be, whether it's academic study, whether it's effectiveness at work, whatever. And so your, your staff can be, as Liz says, you know, it, there are some good examples, I'm sure across the world, I know across the world actually, around perhaps from different sectors, but librarians are really good. One of the things I love about this profession is that we share knowledge. And I think there are ways, and, and people have done it, and we'll need to moderate them, of showing that, that technology enables us to do what we're yeah. the other big part of our role, which is focusing on, on people and on our communities. And, and the moderation is, is um, I talk too much, I should let you talk, but the moderation is so important. I remember like an example springs to mind that I was walking in the library and they had this hideous Christmas decoration on the shelves. And it was really, it looked awful. And I said, what is this doing here? And they said like, like well, then, then people know that all the sheet music, the recipes and all the books with Christmas are in that, that place. And I said, okay, that, that's, but why? <laughs> And yeah, well, then they don't have to come to the desk and talk to us. And so, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. <laughs> no, 
there is still quite some moderation work yeah. to do there yeah. to 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 yeah. tell our people like like you you're more than just there for for giving information you're there to talk to people listen to people and have a conversation all the time i mean basically that's but, but anyway drifting out um one of the other things i've written down is like uh, on, and, and this was already mentioned through these times, the digital in the Netherlands, we have seen an increase in, in digital lending, uh, use of ebooks and all the other things, like an acceleration of, of, of that, uh, which is great. On the other hand, it also painfully pointed out of this time that, that while having like a 98 or 95% of internet coverage, everybody has access at home somewhere uh, connected. It didn't mean that everybody had a laptop or everybody could could use that or had hell of a lot of uh, especially younger students and children um, finding it difficult to get their hands on, on good working devices and giving that that access that they needed so the thing i wanted to to you guys to think about was um what do we do with the people who are ahead uh, even if there is access, which is not in all places, uh, how do we help the people who are not able to, to, to find their way, to get a device or to, to what shoot libraries? What, what, is, what, how can we do a better job at that? I'm going to, to Jean to start, just giving it to someone. Yeah, um, okay. So I think I need to provide some context about Singapore. So in Singapore, the government has been quite active in doing that. So whether it's for school children, or for families to ensure that they do have that level of access. Our biggest problem, Eric, is not so much access, uh, but is digital literacy. So the understanding of how to make use of um, equipment and also simple things like how to connect to social media and all that. So we've launched a, a program called the Seniors Go Digital. And this is a library is a large part of that. So what we do is that at the libraries, we actually teach people, teach the seniors, and we got ambassadors uh, that teach the seniors how to use uh, this sort of thing. I wanted to bring that up because Eric, I think, I'm sorry if I stray from your point, Eric, you can smack me a little bit if I do that too often. But I, I wanted to say this because it was a national initiative. And I feel that sometimes libraries need to get onto the national zeitgeist. We still need to figure out what's happening nationally and then to catch on to that. So we caught on to this program, which is uh, done by uh, the Singapore Digital Office, SG Digital okay. Office. Yeah, and then they wanted to ensure that everybody knows that. The other programs include the digitalization of business. So it's not just those who are without equipment, but how can businesses actually catch up? So a lot of businesses who have relied on the previous model have actually fallen behind. So how do we get them to digitalize that? So I think those are also important. So I think the library is working on um, also helping businesses to level up. So besides equalizing, which is a big program that I think the library is working on, we're also working on something we call elevation. Uh, it's not enough to bring them to the same level because it's like a game. You know, once you get them to that level, others would have moved on. And once again, they're left behind. So the library is working on a series of programs. We call it the Digital Equalizer but also the digital elevator. So it's to lift everybody up, not just to bring you up to someone else, because there is no point to bring them up to, to bridge the gap. So the idea is to lift everybody up. So we are working on, uh, I think, uh, an inspiration series. A very good colleague of mine is developing that. We call it Mythos, to get people excited about the possibilities and also to show, socialize them to the technology that is available. Yeah, so those are some of the things that we're doing then. Uh, we'll be building next year. I don't know if I should say this, but I, I believe it should be on the media. We are building a library uh, next year. It's a regional library, which is our second largest tier of libraries uh, that, will be, um, that will be for the differently abled. Okay. Yeah. So everything in the library, every, uh, every category or service in the library uh, will be something that is thought of so that someone with a different ability would also be able to use it. Yeah, so we are actually devoting the, the thought process for the, the whole library to that. So I think that there are different elements of this area. I'm sorry to stray, but I think there's so many categories of people who need to be elevated that we need to look at. That sounds really amazing. And one, one question, Jean, is like uh, when you say businesses catch up, does it also involve uh, 
political bodies catching up. Like, like I know from our uh, governmental offices, there's uh, sometimes quite a need to digitally catch up as well. Uh, we also offer them their services, that sort of services. Yeah, so government services somewhat, but to a large extent in our library system, as well as our social system, uh, there are also other networks. So there are government services networks, like community centers as well, community clubs. So they work very well with libraries. And sometimes we are actually located in the same place. So as part of the whole town and city planning, uh, we work in tandem with them. So they do things like uh, messaging communications and also government services communications. So it's actually part of the entire ecosystem. So it's very important for the libraries in Singapore to be plugged into that. In fact, we are gradually moving towards a model where we are co-located. So whether it's with other services or whether with other malls. So the libraries does, does not have to shoulder everything on its own. Yeah, we work in tandem with a whole suite of uh, government bodies and services. So whether it's social sector uh, and whether it's a cultural sector to go together. And we, we sort of believe it will be stronger together as a grouping. Wow, impressive. Um, I have to remember that people, you can, if you have questions to this great panelists, please put them in the chat. And at the end, we will reserve time. Uh, we will bring them up and, uh, and have your difficult questions to the panelists <laughs> over here. Margaret, do you have anything uh, on, on the exploration? Uh, of course you have. Thanks, Eric. I think, I think libraries have, have to move if we haven't already, but I think we have to move uh, past just access to technology. Um, although I think from some policy makers, there's still an assumption that everyone has access and everyone has the skills. And we know that that is not the case. Um, Western Australia has a number of very unique geographical challenges and there are whole areas of our state where people have really, really poor access and no access. Um, but we've, in our own organisation, we've moved past it when we have clients that come and use our ground floor space, which is basically an IT access space, um, really by analysing what staff, the sort of responses and help that staff were having to give in an informal basis. And we've moved now into almost, a, we've designed a separate area where staff can, uh, a client can be referred to a staff member who will sit with them and take them through access to government websites, to the digital health work, um, to a whole range of services. And that it's intensive because it is a one-on-one, -on -one, but it moves past that just providing access and assuming that access is the only problem. Getting on the agenda at the policy level with government is always challenging. And, you know, we have seen um, some moves with that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually really optimistic that I think at least in my own jurisdiction, there's a recognition of what libraries are doing, how they are already contributing and what the possibilities are. But I think we also have to step up and move past just saying, if I put some public PCs with internet access in the corner that that that's all we have to do. We have to go way past that because yeah. our world, like it or not, is now almost completely digital from a business and government and personal perspective. So we have to, if we're serious about learning, about knowledge, we have to give people those skills. Great, great, great words, Mara. You're totally right. Uh, Liz, how does it relate to that, to, to the British Library? I think I'm just the going to... I'm just going to, to follow on from what, what Margaret was saying. I think libraries have always been about learn part of, you know, we're about our content and our own collections. We're about our space, but we're also about enabling people to use those spaces, that information properly to function in, in a fully in, in, in society as, as, as citizens. And I think that information literacy, and I'm using this here as a, an umbrella term to include media literacy, to include data, to include AI, is always what librarians have been about. So we, yes, just providing that access is not enough. We need to enable people to develop the skills to question that information, to, to find it, to analyze it, to use it effectively. And this is what we've always done. Uh, this is what libra libraries and librarians have always done, and I think perhaps we need to be, be more assertive about doing it. The other thing I would say, and, and this will lead on to some, something we are doing, is that we need to be 
as, as others have, have said, I think this is our time. In, in the UK, at least, I would say there's a real sense that libraries, particularly public libraries, have a role to play. We've always known that, but I think our government and it's with its talk of levelling up and I'm going to yeah. steal some of Jean's ideas and, and, and mm. uh, see what we can make of those in the UK, is, is really... You know, it seems to me that we haven't had the chance to grasp an opportunity. What we're not so good ab about doing in the UK is provide is having an evidence base. We're very good at talking about how good we are. We're not so good at showing that. And I think that's really important in, in, in thinking about moving past access, as Margaret and, and, and Liz and Jean have, have said. One of the things we've done with, with our one of another one of our networks, which is our business and information property centre network, is uh, help businesses, um, help people start businesses and help small businesses transition into slightly larger businesses. So it's a business and information property centre which started in St Pancras uh, in the early years of this century. And now we have over 20 networks in public libraries across the UK. Yeah. Again, it's that sort of information support that people can give businesses. We wanted to prove that we were making a difference to local economies in partnership with the local public, public libraries that we work with. So we commissioned some research and the output of that research was published in a, a, a report called Democratising Entrepreneurship. And it said that for every one pound invested in the centre, six pounds fifty was, was yeah. put, put into the local economy. Now that is clear, clear evidence. And I would suggest, you know, taking cost into account, that we actually need to think more about building an evidence base and learning from each other, learning across sectors, learning internationally about how we can make more of that sort of uh, create more of that sort of evidence that actually speaks to government. It worked so well with our government that in our, our budget of last year, in, um, we just before shut down, so a couple of years ago now, we were given £13 million pounds to, to increase that network across the UK. And, and so for me, that speaks really loudly to actually uh, creating an evidence base and speaking in the right language to the people with the power and the, and the money. Wow, that's really blown away. And like I said, if you ever have a chance to get Jean from Singapore to Britain when we're traveling again, you yes. must. I can, yes, I'd love that. From my own experience, I can tell you that. Um, it, it, it's amazing to have them in your country and talk to the right people and, and share some of this experience. It's really uh, special. But, but Liz, Liz McGilligan, uh, listening to this, um, and, and when I was listening to Liz Jolly here, I was also thinking of that amazing work reach that you have in Great Britain that I also work with, David Fletcher, doing amazing stuff with businesses. Uh, I was thinking of rebooting and... and um, the Manchester Public Library, of course, that spring to mind with all the things they're doing out there. Uh, I think if we can convince our governments to, do, to yeah. see libraries as key factors to reboot and invest ourselves out of this crisis, it is it's something mm -hmm. we need to do that. We need to yeah. do that. But, but I'm drifting away. Um, Liz McGillian, what, what do you I think the, the public library has always been the street corner university and libraries did for reading and literacy what we need to do now is the same for technology and upskilling and leveling up, et cetera. And I think Liz is spot on right about the promotion and the evidence base. One of the things we've been rubbish at is promoting just how much the public library does. We've all kept it well under the radar. So the whole idea of the evidence base and promoting and the branding and the whole essence of a brand, I think, for public libraries must be trust. It must be the trust, especially in these days of horrendous misinformation. So basically, I think collaboration, cooperation, and let's come back to the fact that the technology needs to free up the staff to, to do all of that um, access and levelling up. It's the only way we're going to be able to do it. But what I do still hark back to, because I'm so old, is the People's Network project. Mm -hmm. with a first, and you've heard me say this before, first UK project that put IT and trained up staff into every library in the UK. It was the only government project brought in on time and on budget. Now I think that whole idea needs a complete refresh. So I think this is something maybe Liz might want to think about. Um, 
that we need to do that again for, for the current climate. And to do that, it means we put the technology in that frees up the staff to do, to work with the people. We need to become, like, once again, the go-to people because at the heart of every community, the public library is best placed to understand everything that's going on around. What businesses are there? What do the public need? So I, I could go on and on forever, but there was a wonderful quote, um, and I'll read the quote and then ask you to tell me when you think it came from, when in the history of time. If the public libraries do not act as a bridge between the new electronic information world and the language and history of print, then no one will. And we will risk losing our heritage, culture, and education. Now, that, those wise words were from 1997. So I think to have seen that then, I think it's in exactly the same position now. Beautiful words, and then, and very, very, very good to bear in mind. Um, we always think that the, the things that are happening to us are happening today and tomorrow, but but these things have been coming for a long time. And, uh, that's one of the reasons I set out my, my world trip in 2007, because I was indeed like, I think it was already mentioned, the end of the book, the death of the book. <laughs> my God, it did not happen. We still have libraries and they are thriving. Uh, but that brings me to the role of the physical building. And maybe we can, I was looking at the time, we have like 20, 25 minutes left before the questions come in. The role of the physical building, the palaces for the people, uh, as they are called, uh, the role of the third place. And there's also, with regard to, um, I will combine the two um, places where you go. And it was also already mentioned for, for lifelong learning, that, that, that university on the corner, um, the role to help create um, critical thinking uh, among our young ones and um, the role of the librarian to create curiosity to, to make it to make it like fun to disagree with each other to elevate discourse and to make it like like fun to go home with more questions than you enter the building with and all that sort of thing that are different from the ways we looked at libraries ages ago um, what, what can you say of the post-COVID role of the physical building will it change? Will it be different? Will it be the same? Is there, uh, like we once said, investing in libraries is, is a way out. Uh, new roles when it comes to the SDGs, when it comes to diversity. These are a thousand questions, I understand, but please take, take some of it. And, and uh, Margaret, I give it to you first. Thanks, Eric. Um, I've, I've given a fair bit of thought about the future of the building, partly because we're just in a process ourselves at the moment at looking at our future physical needs. Um, and I, I think we have a real challenge ahead of us. And I, I just, I, I'm really optimistic. I think that um, libraries as a, a, a people place, or, you know, people have described it, you know, the community hub, the centre of the community, they're best connected because they know what's happening in the local community. All of that's really valid. All of that's really important. But I can't help a niggling suspicion that we're um, putting we're putting a particular generational hat on. If you think about COVID, we've got a number of teenagers and kids that are coming through an education system now that is going to be mostly online. They've spent the last year doing online schooling. Um, what are universities planning? I think, you know, from what I'm hearing is that there's a much bigger uh, push to do online delivery of lectures and courses. So whilst on the one hand, I'm really optimistic about buildings, investment in public libraries, investment in libraries as the People's University, the community hub, I have a niggling suspicion of just let's think about this really carefully if we've got a whole generation coming behind impacted by COVID, who will be decision makers, who will be making decisions about where money's allocated, how in a much, uh, if they've come in, come from a much um, more concentrated digital world, let's just be really careful that we don't 
just going down one path with about, without thinking about how we can engage those people. So I don't have an answer, but I just think it's a question that we've got to keep in our mind. But, but Margaret, you say we, in this case, do you see also, uh, we're, we're talking now on an IFLA uh, thing, do, do you see a role yeah. for, for organizations? Do you see we as a, as let's, let's, let's have this chat that we're having right now, like once every two months or three months, or how, how do you see this? How do you see the we in this? Well, I think it's something that as a profession, we have to take on board and that's going to be always at the local level, but then working, you know, locally and nationally and internationally. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we have a lot of good advocacy and arguments for investing in public libraries. They don't, those arguments don't always resonate everywhere and everyone is constrained by their own individual circumstances. So I think we have to continue to do that. What I think we have to also be doing in background is making sure that we're talking to and understanding the needs of this new generation um, and what will they look like? What will they want out of physical spaces? What will, how will they want to meet? Will it only be digitally or are they looking for that hybrid model? I think there's a certain generation and I'm one of them that have come out of lockdown lockdown that want to be physically with people. If I was 16, 17, 18, and I've spent the last year just learning online, what that, how might that change how I want to engage in learning and knowledge, not necessarily social activities, but how might that change how I want to engage? Um, and I think we need to ask ourselves those questions and ask the community that, you know, engage the community by them, for them, what do they want? How do they see it um, coming down the, you know, into the future years? Totally true. I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go on to to Jean who looks 19 always for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by look 19, Eric? I am 19. <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I've been working on this a little while and let, let me just share some perspectives about our recent efforts to persuade government. Uh, I'm going to reference a non-library project that I just came off. Uh, and so in Singapore, a lot of people think that um, teenagers are not interested in Singapore's history because it's known to be rather short. And also there aren't as many interesting characters like, like in a lot of the places else, especially in Europe especially in Britain. So we don't have those colourful characters. Um, so when I was asked to do a project that looked at Singapore's history uh, from 700 years ago, I could have chosen to do, you know, the usual information heavy stuff like, wow, we've got to let you learn, you know, you've got to learn guys because you're lacking in something. So instead, I think we employ technologies from, from theatre, from illusion, and uh, even from mechatronics. Uh, not suggesting that you have to do that, but the whole thing was that it broke the records for exhibition uh, visitation in Singapore. And uh, most of the people who came were teenagers. A lot of them were forced to come because they had school visits and all that. But after they came, uh, they told their friends and their friends started coming. And this is before COVID, uh, even when they were sick because they were dying to come. And then they brought their parents along because it was, it was something that was really good. So I feel that it is also the way that we develop the format and the way that we pitch the government. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but sometimes maybe the whole concept of library as a place, library for reading, for learning, lifelong learning, joy of learning, I think it's all good. But on occasion, we need, like Liz said, to adjust the language. We might need to put that aside. Not that it's not important. It's a bit Machiavellian because we're still going to achieve it. But the language needs to be different. So I'm just going to share this little tidbit that I did recently because I, in the previous project, I was working with the uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister as well as the head of the civil service. Uh, so when I came back to the library, I said, okay, let me try and use whatever connections I have to bridge it. So when I had occasion to speak to the head of civil service, who's the head of all the public servants in Singapore, I pitched in the idea of the library or NLB as a platform service. Okay, it's much used in Silicon Valley in any startups that want to have billions of dollars. But I said, let's rethink the library as a platform service. And as a platform service, what do we have? And I started to shoot out some numbers. Um, 
these numbers may not be impressive to you, but Singapore is a small country. I said, we have nearly 85 million digital accesses. You know, we have close to 40 million content items. Yeah, about 30, close to sometimes uh, 30 million people walk through our doors. That is actually the Amazon spirit of agglomeration. That's how Amazon started its business. Yeah, the, it's a virtual cycle of agglomeration. You start to build, as you build a base, more and more people join in. So I said, if you are a platform service for the whole of Singapore, this is a great base for other partners to join in to provide their content. And as more partners come into this, we get more content, more content, get more users, more users, more partners. The library is actually in a unique position, a public good provider of content that is so strong in the virtual cycle of agglomeration that it will be very, very difficult for anyone to come in and to break this. Yeah, it's, it's quite hard to be disrupted. But I'd like to think that we have to maybe rethink the position of libraries and that's what we've done for the government. And they were very excited about it. They were excited about the library as a platform. So they said, bring the partners in, start some of these projects and then let us see what you come up with. And this is the sort of thing that we will fund. So sometimes Liz, I agree with you, the adjustment of the language is actually quite critical. So yes, I am borrowing from Amazon. On occasion, I will borrow from Netflix. I'll borrow from Duolingo. And I will shamelessly borrow from WeWork. And my last point, which is related to what Margaret <laughs> is saying just now. WeWork has a concept that failed because our friend was too busy buying houses and, you know, and, and spending money in millions. But he had a good concept. And his concept was a physical social network. It didn't work because he never, our dear Adam never got our real estate. But we don't have to. We have the real estate, we have the connections. What is the meaning of a physical social network in the libraries of the future? How does that correspond with the digital network? It is, an, uh, and I want to end with this to say that I, I, I get very affected when arguments go along the route of a zero sum game that, you know, if you go digital, it's going to kill your physical. Yeah. And it's not just about doing both but it's about the two of them actually coming together and pushing each other along. Yeah, so I believe yeah. that is the future. The physical social networking, that's what libraries are. I mean, it's absolutely uh, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> I love it. At least uh, I see you on my screen, so please respond with Jolly. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that was fantastic. Um, and, and I think that um, I, I agree with, with, with the points that, that Jean and, and, and Mark could have made it. It's um, thinking about um, library space. I think um, to, the phrase that comes to mind for me is, is around co-creation, and and around um, both. You know, if you're looking for funding, talking to your, your funders in language, they appreciate co-creation with your community, whether that's the the, the the local community, the national community, whether it's an academic um, community, and thinking about what people want to do in that space. I think. A lot of libraries, and I think um, uh, the um, Scott Bennett used to write about this, didn't he, in, in terms of university libraries, around um, a lot of university libraries were written as, were, were designed around services, around storage for books and around delivering services. And now we need to think about what goes, what's going on in there. One of the things we did in my, my last role when we were doing a, a major refurbishment was to follow students around in a, in a good, good way and look at how they were learning and also get them to keep learning diaries about what was going on in the space and why and how they interacted. And I think that whole um, uh, idea of a technology uh, enabled uh, networking or learning or, or researching spaces is really important. That... Um, uh, the fact that, as Jean says, it's not a zero-sum game. The old-fashioned term in the 90s was hybrid library, and, and, and that was used in, in the UK a lot um, when technology was coming in. But I think the word hybrid or integrated is, is, is something that we need to go back to, because, as you say, it's, it's about both. It's about technology enabling lots of, of different learning, and it's about technology or digital Digital not support, but if you use the phrase technology, that can mean a, a codex. 
it, it's about using the appropriate technology for what you want. It can be a pen and paper, can't it? Yeah. It's about using any technology for, for the activity that you want to do. And that's what libraries can do. But I, I think for me, the, the thing about space and, and thinking about how we do it in, in a COVID world is that we do it with our communities. We develop the space for the activities that they need to do. We do it in, 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 um, in partnership. I take all the points about generational change and so on. What I'm hoping for is that we have um, at some sort of equivalent of um, the roaring 20s, as some commentators are saying, but the roaring this time will be people, people roaring in libraries um, rather than, well, as well as uh, in, in, in more, more social spaces. That's so funny. I was, I was, I was working on a, a song for the conference, Computers in Libraries, and it was ended with, um, was a sentence, and I realized it was from the rock opera Tommy by The Who, who you're great, The Who uh, from Great Britain in the UK. And I think 21 is going to be a good year. It's one of the, I think, 21 is going to be a good year. So maybe we are indeed in the roaring 20s of, uh, of this century, and we have that opportunity. Um, this, this Miguel again, I'm going to you, but I want to add to this brilliant conversation. This, you're doing such great work here. Um, already heard about the, 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 there are of course, David Lenk is brought in the community librarian, yeah. that sort of extra skill that we, that we talked about earlier. Um, there is the Nina Simon, I, I organized a bootcamp for the Off By For All movement from, from the US. Uh, Nina Simon did a brilliant job starting that up. Uh, and it, it was sold out in a week, like seven countries, 200 people, like it was, there's so much demand for, for this way of thinking and involving uh, our users in a co-creative uh, thinking of what the future of libraries can and will be like. And I think adding to that, before I go to Liz McGannigan, and the, the idea of not only like physical social network, uh, but adding to that, the, the effect that what can we do to help people create the society that they want to live in? How do we can work on those SDGs, those sustainment development goals, what we can do about diversity, what can we do on uh, the fake news bubbles, everything else. There's a bigger task than just being that physical social network. We yeah. come with a mission. Uh, but first, before you all, because we are ah, time, uh, Liz McGilligan, please respond to this. Then we go back to the list. Oh, I, I loved hear, hearing from the other panelists and I loved hearing what Jean had to say there. Totally agree that, that there's this huge opportunity to, at the moment to create a platform that first and foremost gives the library a, a high quality standard because most of the websites for libraries etc are absolutely diabolical so there's no good reason for any to almost trust if you like the front end of a public library so if together we could create this fabulous platform that people can then get involved in the co-creation all of that means we directed people to the physical space, which is what I'm all about is, let's get all of the fabulous digital in one place and let people co-create and add to it and direct them to the library as a space for the development of everything that we've heard from all of the people on the panel today. So I come back to thinking, this is a world of opportunity for us. And I feel very, very positive about where we go from here. So let's just get on with it. Uh, Liz Jolly, go to the other Liz here. Uh, yeah, oh, so, yeah, I was just agreeing with Liz. And I think that that David Lanks, you were talking about we have a mission. And I think that David's words about our mission is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation. Yeah, absolutely exactly sums up about what, what we're about. And I very much... That's something that uh, I have on my office wall and uh, very much try and, and live by it in a professional sense. And, and I think, as people are saying, this is our time. There are lots of opportunities here. Excellent. Margaret? Um, it's pretty hard to add to that. There's nothing to disagree. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And uh, I notice, you know, um, one of the some of the comments in the chat that's going on to the side, but you know, how can we best support our communities after this last year? Mm. Um, and I think that's that's absolutely our um, mission, and I, we absolutely have a responsibility. Um, 
but you know it's up it's for each of us to be listening to what it is that those communities need and engaging them in in that process around what is best for them yes using the physical libraries as a fabulous um, open trusted um, safe physical space for that to happen but also enabling um, the digital engagement if that's if that's the preference and do you also feel before you go to the question i'm not following the chat otherwise oh, i'll get blue <laughs> distracted <laughs> but if i um how do you feel about the, the, that, that what I was saying, the role to, to maybe be more active as a facilitator on, on different things than just books, but health, uh, sustainment development goals and all the other things that I did to mm -hmm. mention. Yeah, are, I, are absolutely. Um, are we ready? I think that would be, um, I think everyone would have to make their own judgment yeah. around that. Should we? Absolutely, we should, because all of, to me, all of that, that discussion, that conversation is tied around knowledge, um, around what is the knowledge that we have, sharing knowledge. Um, we've, we've run our, a festival of ideas here for a number of years and my opening conversation around that is libraries have always been about ideas. It's just that they've been in particular containers called books for a very long time. So having a a conversation opportunity, hearing speakers engaging with um, speakers is still about ideas and still about knowledge. Which it's just different containers, different ways to get that out and to share it. So um, yes, we need different skills to be able to do that. I'm sure the skills that I learned when I went to library school many, many years ago are not going to be particularly helpful there. But um, you know, community engagement skills, um, you know, they're, they're the skills that we're going to need on top of understanding how information is structured and delivered and all of those technical skills. So we, perhaps we're not prepared fully yet, but I think we're heading down that path. Okay, Jean, before we go to the questions and to make it really like a sort of a, an interactive session and listen to the people listening in, uh, what, what do you have to say as last words on this? I, I have been thinking about ideas a lot. Margaret, I love the festival of ideas. Please yeah. ask me to come. I love to, I love to join a festival of ideas. Okay, so I've been pitching an idea to the government. And the idea is that I would like the library to be part of the conversation about the post-COVID world and post-COVID Singapore. But it's not just about coming here to look at materials, resources, and content. I want us to be actually in the mainstream of that. So the idea that I pitched the government is let the library be a theater of ideas so that the library is at the forefront of a tidal wave of solutions that looks at all the things that we're going to do to solve the problems that COVID has exposed about, all the visuals, all the gaps that have exposed about society. Uh, so in Singapore, we've launched a lot of alliances. So these are action alliances where people talk about solutions for the future. So they range from everything from diversity, equality, sustainability, and the whole, the whole gene gang. So I said, I tell what guys, give me all of those ideas. Let me choreograph it as a library. Let me create a theater of ideas for you. Uh, so I, I actually told them, Liz, I'm not sure I can pull it off. I said, this theater of ideas will be literally how Harry Potter and the Cursed Child made it to the theater. It will be a theater of ideas the same way that it could have been a book but yeah. Rowling made it into theatre. So can we make those ideas in the theatre? So um, I'm going to get a decision next week. It's gone to cabinet. It's cleared five ministers. It's gone to cabinet. We'll get a decision next Wednesday. And uh, we hope if it comes through, our physical libraries will actually become a physical manifestation of lived-in environments that Singaporeans have envisaged and designed for the future. So the libraries, you have an installation on the okay. future of work, the future of society, the future of, uh, of sorry, retail, because I love shopping, uh, different aspects that has a physicality in the first school library. So anyone can walk in and say, okay, I cannot just read about the future. I can see the future. I can feel the future. Oh, ah, the choreography <laughs> of the dance, the dance of the libraries. It's, a, <laughs> it's what we want. Uh, we have 15 minutes for questions. I'm, I'm going to ask Liz White, uh, who is somewhere doing no doubt brilliant work at the back, um, to, to, to stop me talking, or I will be the voice of, of some of the people 
asking questions. Liz, do you have any questions that you want to put forward? Do I have to go to the chat? What do I have to do? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Or good Just morning, UK. Um, yes, our first question is from Jane Cowell, um, which is whether, um, whether the panellists see the future of libraries as being more about collaboration, um, partnership, or potentially um, co-location with other services? And will we see more radical collaborations in the times ahead? I, I certainly think there is a great opportunity. Um, apart, apart from the fact that in the UK, there are some issues around the high street. And I think there's a perfect opportunity for the public library in the high street to become a, a place, a venue that co-locates co and collaborates with so many people in the area. So I think there's a real opportunity through that collaboration. Partnerships have always been at the heart of public libraries, haven't they? I think um, there's a definite need post-COVID to get round the table with all of the partners that can support um, an uplift in the community. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I, I just shared two examples. Again, like Liz was still working this out, but I think, you know, librarians share. So I'll share two examples that we're working on. So one of them, I'm sorry, Eric, was pilfered from Netflix. Uh, so when Netflix was developed, uh, it started as rental facility and then it started to bring content. So Netflix is a combination of Netflix originals as well as uh, material from all the different studios. So we are building what we currently term the library superstore. And the idea of the library superstore is that eventually the library's content, the amount that we collect and that we build, will shrink in proportion to the content they bring in. So we are activating our resources to bring in content from all over. So whether it's from the community, whether it's from, uh, from, from societies, NGOs, from governments and all that, and other creators to put into this. And using, we hope, a, a cocktail of algorithms. So whether it's AI, whether it's mm -hmm. um, uh, content tagging, linked open data, or just Spotify playlists to pull it together. So the content partnership uh, looking to Netflix is one way that we're working on this. The second thing that we're doing is, I'm sorry, learning from WeWork, the idea of We community. So we're linking to the idea of library takeovers. Are there parts of a library that you could actually let organizations take over? So it could be a digital takeover. It could be a physical takeover. And for them to actually run the services and draw their audience to a library rather than the library continue to try to reach those audiences. So those are two, one in the physical realm and one in the digital realm. And, and Gina, I never thought I would ask that question coming from me, but how do you, you have an idea how to work this on themes to how do you not catalog it, but how do you, how do you make that like, how do you help people search for what they want? Yeah, so, so the thing about search, the thing about search, and this is something I've learned after looking at Netflix is that uh, about 75 to 80% of what people see on Netflix is not through search. It's through recommendations. But of course, the catalog is massive. So in the library, of course, there's always a search, search function. But I think we have to work better. I'm sorry, to learn from retail. We have to work better at our Harrods shop windows. Or like the Americans here who are awake, the Bergdorf Goodman's shop window. We have to work better at that, and which is what Netflix has done beautifully, applying AI to even what you see, uh, different faces that you see. So for the same movie, they have possibly uh, several different posters that mm. respond yeah. to you. Yeah. So I think we have, to, we have to look at that to see how can libraries not always be a fire hydrant? You know, we give you so much because we are so brilliant. But how do we learn the art of giving you just enough? Yeah, just enough to bring you in, to draw in so that you can get more. So that's something that Eric are working on. The idea of shop windows, shop fronts like uh, as a concept for this new library superstore. Liz, do you want to respond to that? Liz Jolly or not? Liz McGillian? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. I'm writing that down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as I say, we love to share, don't we, as a profession? And uh, borrow and all those, those sorts of things. Um, I Eagle. think... Sorry. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, there has to be more more collaboration. I, I think in, in the UK, um, 
as, as Liz said, there's always been partnerships um, and uh, the, the partnerships that, that we're leading on in the British Library are the Living Knowledge Network um, and, as I mentioned before, and the um, Business and, and Intellectual Property uh, Network. Um, what I would say is that um, we need to think more strategically about those. There are currently 150 something public library authorities in England alone. Um, you know, Scotland and, 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 National, and Northern Ireland and uh, Wales work, work differently. And I think what we can see is that where libraries um, work together more closely, the benefits for their communities are, are, are clear to see. Now, whether that's, um, you know, there's, there's some research work going on around, around um, digital sharing, whether that's around um, staff learning and development, and a lot of what the Living Knowledge Network uh, does is, 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 is around both events and, and staff development, uh, whether that's around content, you know, and actually getting to the knotty uh, issues around licensing and copywriting that, that are, you know, are impacting on us all uh, at the moment. Um, who knows but yes we need to be radical i would also suggest that that we need to be radical within the profession and think about working with a, across the sector so public libraries local university libraries workplace libraries health libraries and there are pockets of good practice but there are, are um uh, but these are very local and and i think there are will be opportunities for, for people um to to work together more closely not will be opportunities there is the opportunity and we need to think radically uh, and more different as as a profession and again speak the right language to people who can who can get this done True. i love the living knowledge network and i think like i saw something pass by that that people asked for can you please put your examples in the chat somewhere i'll, I'll list this this mm. white um yeah maybe we can we can put some of the links uh, to yeah. it Jean's brilliant ideas and the others. Uh, uh, the, there's so many things that have been said over this last, in this conversation that are absolutely good and worth hearing that I will definitely ask you or ask anyone to put them in there. Um, Liz White, is there another question that we can put to the panel? Unless the other ones want to come back to it or go to a new, go to a new question, new question. Thank you. Our second question is from um, Adriana from Brazil, which is pointing, who's pointing out that the world is not the same and has changed so much over the last year. People have lost relatives, friends, their plans and their dreams. How can libraries support communities who've been affected by COVID? Grief. How can libraries respond to grief? That is a good question. It's a difficult one. I remember, I remember I had a conversation. I was blessed to have lunch with the king and queen one day when I was nominated as best librarian of the Netherlands. And one of the things she kept talking about was that um, the, the, the dog died and the princesses were all very devastated by the death of the dog. And the princess was still young at that time. And she went to the library, imagine, uh, and she found great help in the librarians and, and books on grief for, for animals that died. This is different, of course, uh, this is, but it's also grief. Um, do you have any, any suggestions how to deal with grief and what role libraries can play? I, I think it comes back to this hunger that people need people, we need human contact. So if this is where the place, the physical space is going to be critical and where staff have the new ideas on how to start conversation cafes or grief cafes, mm. cup of coffee, just a chat, yeah. resources. It's, yeah. I've come back to saying the technology is only there to free up those staff to do that, exactly yeah. that. I, I think uh, as someone who's experienced a, a fair amount of uh, grief in, 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 in my life, support as well as counselling, and I think libraries can obviously, you know, put people in touch with those services a support network of people who've been through the the, the same thing is, is something that i personally have found really valuable and, and whether they're grief cafes or grief groups as someone suggested absolutely and that's something that libraries can can hold um they can you know be spaces for for groups for for one-to-one -one support they can uh, provide uh, information on on you know that all the sorts of grief grief books that people find helpful 
and I also so think some people when they when they grieve want want to be alone. Some people want to be with people. We're all human. We're all different. And providing those variety of spaces where you can go, where you might not want to be in the four walls of, of a place where it, you know that has too many lovely but also painful reminders of of, of, of dead people is a, is a thing in itself. So I, I think that there is um, uh, a, a way that libraries can can um, coordinate, uh, can, can offer support, connection to professionals, though. I think this is, again, a different sort of partnership. And actually reflecting back on the last question as, I, as I'm, I'm speaking, I think that one of the radical partnerships in answer to, 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 to the question that we, we could think about is how we explicitly support those communities in terms of the spaces, but in terms of connection to, um, to resources and to professional people who really can help people who've lost loved ones. Beautifully, beautifully said. Uh, I remember that, that uh, going back to Nina Simon, she had a museum, she was director of a museum and she had those memory jars. Uh, yeah. So they yeah. gave them shelves yeah. and they put memory yeah. jars in the shelf. Yeah. I think how beautiful yeah. would it be if, if libraries would offer some free space for people yeah. to make their own memory jar yeah. of a person they, they lost and, and mm. share those. Yes. That, that would be like, a, that would be a really nice service to have. So I would say grief can be personal and it's perhaps about, again, talking, co-creating with a community of people who've lost people about what is most meaningful to, to them. But that's a lovely idea too. Margaret, any ideas? Liz, Jean? You're free to step in. We have five minutes before we have to... We can okay, I'll, I'll go really quickly. Eric, I'll do it really quickly. So I, I have two ideas. It's not directly related to that, but there were two things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so very quickly, one of them is uh, inspired by Interstellar, the movie by yeah. uh, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not going to give it away, but at a certain point in the movie, there was a bookshelf. And uh, in the bookshelf on the other side was the past of... Matthew McConaughey. Uh, so inspired by that, I think about thinking of creating almost like a digital wall, a uh, digital wall of libraries, but every library is a book of life. And we are thinking of engaging uh, writers, illustrators, and uh, folks who are doing AI and to, to develop each of these digital book as almost like a deep tribute to uh, the ones who have gone through COVID, yeah. So that's one project I'm working on. The other project I'm working on is called Plus One. Uh, so plus one is about, because sometimes I think people might find very hard to come to the library on their own, especially if they've gone through something quite terrible. So we thought using plus one, but the topic is, uh, in this case, uh, not about grief, but the topic is about causes, C-A-U-S-E. There are causes that they'll be interested in, things that they're interested to participate in. Uh, so things that they are able to build. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, one, one other option of looking at how to deal with grief. Uh, using the plus one, maybe even pyramidal way of bringing people in and then getting them to work on something for someone else on a cause that matches to them. Great stuff, great stuff. Margaret, anything? Um, we have like a few minutes um, left. Well, I've been pondering this because I have to say certainly uh, in, Australia, in Western Australia, but in Australia, the, the impact has been much less and... I would have to say, if you came and visited Perth today, you would barely see anything different from pre-COVID. But the the issue that the, the what I found really interesting, and in fact, I'll think about this after this, is that capturing of the memories. And I've seen the Nina Simon with the jar, yeah. and for me, that resonated really strongly with our role to collect the documentary yeah. heritage and the stories of Western Australia. So even if it's not around grief, there's still a, you know, specifically targeted around grief. And I appreciate that some communities are much more impacted. Um, there still is that sense to me that if we can collect and store those memories for future generations to, yeah. to also understand, I think, is a really important role, something yeah. we should think seriously about. Right. Can I... Yeah. Can I just add, um, add, add to that, that as the National Library of, of the UK, we are collecting, we have a COVID collection and we are actively collecting um, mm. materials produced 
uh, during this time, because as, as, as uh, Margaret says, it's about being a memory institution too and, and valuing that, that, that cultural, that collective cultural uh, experience. And, 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 value and we, we've done that. We've done some commissioned oral histories, um, including around Olympians that didn't get to, to go to Japan, for example. But here I'm thinking back to more the really community level, and I think yeah. it's something yeah, absolutely. that public yeah, libraries yeah. yeah. are their own local history collections, their local studies collections. That's a, yeah. a yeah. fabulous way to actually have something as a network that we could um, have as a program or as an initiative mm. so yeah yeah a different sort of partner collaboration actually mm. in terms of, mm. of international covid memories yeah i'm sure les mcgilligan will, will find a way to make this in a digital attractive uh, accessible feature uh, in one of the great stuff that they're doing out there in, in, in scotland please um it's over. We, we, we have to do this every month, I think. It's, it's just too short. Mm -hmm. There's so much great stuff to talk about. You have been amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, Liz Jean and Margaret, for, for, for doing this. Um, it's, 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 it's flown by. It was like, like gone in a second. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for all the people listening in. I think there were about 130 that I saw will probably be watched. Uh, or rewatched uh, later on by by quite a few people. I think uh, I'm going to rewatch it definitely for sure because that's amazing things, and uh, I love to see you all soon. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.